You're welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our second PhD symposium presented by the Department of Languages and Literature of Uganda Christian University. Today, we have a very interesting topic, depiction of corporal punishment in the Ugandan novels. And with us, we have Miss Naula Mary O'Wall, our PhD student, who is going to take us through her experiences, perhaps, but most importantly, how corporal punishment is defined and depicted in the novels of Julia Sochino, Mary Karuru Okrut, and any others that she, she might want to refer to. You realize that uh, this topic comes at a time when we are questioning our education system in Uganda. Where does violence come from? In all the corners of our country, we experience violence of some sort. In the most unlikely places, And we know that corporal punishment was uh, declared illegal by the Minister of Education. And in many countries, not only Uganda, it is a violation of human rights. But here, as scholars of literature, we are here to analyze, discuss, and see how these matters have been shared through literature. In this case, the novel. The beauty of it, not that corporal punishment is beautiful, but how it has been portrayed in these novels. Here with us are other scholars in their own right, whom I'll ask to introduce themselves, starting with Thank you. Do, why do the Lumas have a part? Umwami, Nibajele Mamwesi, Nabasi Midenavi, Mwanya Rakweza, in presentation, Oba Munga Nikaishin. My name is Lillian Namataka. I'm a graduate of UCU. Currently, I work with the School of Research and Postgraduate Studies. I work, with an I work as an intern with a a very, um, a very experienced and uh, I, I don't know what else to describe her, but a very determined American woman. And I'm very happy to be working with her as an intern. Our work is to help the master's students with their dissertations. It's a really, uh, I'm really excited to be here because this is my first experience. Thank you. Thank you. Nashabera Kubareva, Nokbahanuya, a Kuja Mujaji presentation. Uh, my name is Tekla Atkwase, and I work in the Ham Kasa Library in charge of uh, electronic resources. I'm glad uh, to be here. I have uh, several times uh, worked with uh, Mary when she's uh, trying to look for literature for her topic. And uh, this is my first time also to attend uh, such a presentation, and I'm grateful. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm sorry, should I speak? Because I had the... Yes, I'm sorry. 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 Ndi mwako kusoka. August, um, ndi kumekerezo mwako kusoka next year, ndi kuingina mwako kwa kubiri. I'm happy to be here. This is my second time to attend this symposium. 
I'm grateful because of Dr. Greve, Patty, I've met her. She's helping me to improve my dissertation. Lina, we've met several times. In fact, uh, almost a whole month, and we are still in touch with her. Madam Naula, I interfaced with her when I came to, uh, to apply for admission. I've never met her. This is my first time. I'm happy to be part of this class, this group of great people. And I hope I will, I will see far, because uh, I'm standing on your shoulders. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Patty Houston Holm. Uh, greetings from Ohio and the United States. Uh, this is my ninth trip to uh, Uganda. And I'm pleased especially to be working with Dr. Cornelius because last year we worked on a children's literature translation project, which was uh, interesting and fun. Um, I'm pleased especially because Mary is not only a good friend of mine, but also I think four years ago we worked together on her master's degree. So, um, and the topic is very interesting and compelling to me. And uh, so I'm just interested in finding out uh, more about the topic and learning from you. Oh, thank you very much. Together with Mark and Dr. Dorothy Mukasa in the background, we would like to bring you back to the discussion. You've heard we start by telling stories. We start by speaking in our, lang in our languages, speaking our tongues. We would like to see how this connects with the authors that we are going to discuss. In which language does bullying take place? In which language does corporal punishment take place? In which uh, spheres and how do these uh, novelists tell us what happens in those dangerous corners of the communities that they are talking about? Um, Reverend Deacon Dr. Cornelius Wambi Gulere, the coordinator of this program, and also co-supervisor with Professor Muranga, who is not able to be with us because he's down in Kabale, he's not able to be with us today. Here now, I hand you over to our presenter for the day who is going to introduce herself in all her capacities and take us through in the next few minutes. Mary. Uh, good morning. May we pray first. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are here before you. For we know you are the source of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And Father, even as we are here, we pray the Lord, you guide us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to be with us as we present and teach us. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. You are welcome to this presentation. Uh, my name is already in the board. I want to thank... Um, all of you for coming, and especially I want to thank my supervisors, um, Dr. Gulere, for his kind service and moving with me side by side, and uh, Professor Moranga. I'm very, very grateful. I know we are reaching somewhere. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, the topic of our discussion today is um, the depiction of corporal punishment in Uganda novels. Presented by Mary Naula, uh, August 30th, 2008. Department of Languages, Literature, uh, PhD Symposium, August 30th, 2018. Thesis, corporal punishment has become a threat to education system in Uganda. Introduction, this paper investigates 
the depiction of corporal punishment in schools as portrayed by Ugandan authors and how it affects the learning of the students and their behavior later on. Two Ugandan novels are used, Julius of Chunyo's Fate of the Banished, 1997, and Mary Karoro Okuruti's The Invisible Weaver, 1998. Problem statement. Even though a school is a place of learning, where students are trained to have civic, emotional, and cognitive development, it has turned to be associated with pain, torture, and suffering. Nas Etel, 2011, depict corporal punishment as a factor contributing in antisocial behaviors, such as theft, running away from school, lying, cheating, and bullying. Purpose. The purpose of this research is to show how Mary Karoro Okuruti's The Invisible Weaver, 1998, and Julius Ochunyo's Fate of the Banished, 19. 97, depict the vice of call poor punishment in Ugandan schools. Literature review. <laughs> Literature <laughs> review. <laughs> Smith Intel, 2004, portrayed corporal punishment as an act which results in unsocial behavior, mental health, depression, alcohol abuse, and poor academic performance among the students. To Lee K, 2002, corporal punishment teaches a child that problems can be addressed through uh, physical aggression, as we shall see later in the characters in uh, Fate of the Banished and The Invisible Weaver. Nazel Etel, 2001, depicted corporal punishment used by authoritarian teachers to discipline children as a leading to unsocial behavior and contributes to academic failure and social rejection. It reduces self-esteem and creates depression, depression mode resulting into criminal behavior among the youth. Patterson, 1982. We shall also look at the characters in the novels uh, concerning the criminal or uh, antisocial behavior. Physicians and pediatricians noted that corporal punishment does not correct negative behavior of students permanently. Boham, 1998, teachers who use corporal punishment may succeed in making the students conform to their standards, but resentment will be reflected by the student's behavior soon or later. As we shall look at um, a period in the novel. Stroud, 1991, depicted corporal punishment as having the ability to increase the probability of deviant and antisocial behaviors, such as aggression, violent act inside and outside the school. Corporal punishment has been associated with a variety of behavioral disorders in children and adults, including anxiety, depression, withdrawal, Law of self-esteem and substance abuse. Uh, Marquardt, 1991. According to Pandy, 2001, corporal punishment makes the students to feel helpless, worthless, depressed, shameful, and doubtful, guilt, inferior, stress, and, and stressful. To Grossino, 1990, if the law does not allow striking adults, why should we strike a child? According to Goodman et al, portrays students who have disorders as more likely to have had corporal punishment when they were young. Corporal punishment is associated with increased aggression in children. Baca, 1964, Patson, 1982. Corporal punishment is associated with the humiliation and helplessness of students. Bowrand and Black, 1967. To Nas Etel, 2011, corporal punishment causes students' mental activity to reduce, loss of boldness, 
create scrumming qualities in students and turn, and turn to aggressions and lack of respect to teachers and elders. As we shall see, Apire fighting with the teacher. From the review literature, no study has been done in the Ugandan context. This paper is an attempt to investigate the analysis of the depiction of corporal punishment in two Ugandan novels, The Invisible Weaver and The Fate of the Banished. Methodology. The study adopted a qualitative content analysis study design. Qualitative content analysis has enabled me to identify themes and characterization. The purpose of content analysis is to provide knowledge, understanding of the phenomenon under study. This research used analysis of documentary primary sources. The documentary evaluation involved reading the novels and analyzing the writer's depiction of corporal punishment in schools. Theoretical framework, this study uses post-colonial literary theory, a critical approach that deals with the literature produced in countries that were once colonies of the other countries. It also deals with the literature written in or by citizens of colonizing countries that take their people as it is subject matter. The theory is based around concepts of otherness and resistance. Post-colonial theory became part of the critical, critical toolbox in 1970s. Some of the proponents of this theory are Franz uh, Fanon, Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, Home K. Baba, um, Silva Kaumar, and Ferreri. Theoretical uh, from a continent, the proponents of the theory examine the ways in which writers from colonized countries attempt to articulate and even celebrate their cultural identities and claim them from the colonizers. They also examine ways in which the literature of the colonized power, powers is used to justify colonialism through the perpetuation of images of the colonized as inferior. Findings in the fate of the banished. Uh, Irabo and Apire are the main characters in this book where the corporal punishment was applied. Irabo, uh, I'll begin with Irabo, is this young student in the class, uh, of course, uh, informal education. And um, the story goes that during the lower class, he loved, he loved education. But later on, as we shall see, what will happen to him? And um, I want to read direct quotation. They began to threaten you with the failure at the end of primary school course, and frequently took a chiboko to you, giving you the kind of hiding that you had your buttocks smartening the whole day. This is a rabble being punished by the teacher. And Shiboko is caning. He's using the mother tongue to bring out the kind of pain he is in. And as, of course, Oshunyo uses some hard stuff there. Hardening is, you know, you get the pain on the buttocks, the real pain. So a rabble is being cane in the class using a, um, uh, is being punished using a cane, which is siboko, that is a lo local language which Ochunyo is using. As we started, we're using local language and we, we can see that uh, Ochunyo is writing in English but um, spicing it with a local language as, uh, as a method of his writing. So, when we look at a rabble, He's already threatened. He says that he has been threatened from the beginning and he thinks that failing is actually something that it should never happen. They frequently talked in terms of strokes of canes and made you feel as if failing the primary living examinations was a disease worse than leprosy and HIV combined. And that if you ever had the misfortune to fail such exams, then you should go to the nearest swamp and drown yourself. You can see what is in the head of Irabo. You know, punishment, 
the corporal punishment that is awaiting him is already comparing it to leprosy uh, combined with HIV AIDS. So the fear and threat is in him. He continued to say, at the end of the year, a rabbi sat the primary living exams and almost failed to make division three. Still his father, who loved education, succeeded in securing him a place in a rural government school, one of the so-called third world schools. But no amount of persuasion could make Irabo join it. When we look at the life of Irabo, as we look from the Smith, uh, Smith et al., 2014, he, his, uh, he portrayed that corporal punishment makes children run away from school. And we can see that the father of Irabo is persuading Irabo to go back to school, but it is a rubble, it is no go area. Then his father tried threats, but to no avail. Next, he suggested a rubble should enroll in technical school and learn at least carpentry or bricklaying or tailoring. But a rubble adamantly refused. He told his father bluntly that he was fed up with the school. Because of corporal punishment, we can look at a rebel who would have enjoyed the life at school. He would have enjoyed being at school and learning new things. He is saying, I am fed up. I am tired. I don't want. Because of corporal punishment. The next character is Apire. Apire is one of our major characters in uh, Chunyo, Fate of the Banished. And uh, here we have a teacher, Taki who was teaching economics in the class. And as was teaching Apire, you know, being a child who is able to understand what is taking place in the class, he was able to ask the teacher, what is the teacher doing? The teacher was teaching about economics. And from nowhere, he veered, he went off the topic and started talking about his problem with a woman or with his wife at home. And Apire says, no. You cannot take us into the family issues. We are here learning economics. To te teach us economics, don't tell us about issues uh, concerning your marriage. And what happened? The corporal punishment was the result. So um, as we start, the teacher says, a pity. The teacher was moving in that direction, his hands on his hips. I did not spend three years at the university and nine months in teacher training so that I could later be insulted by my student. Some of you seem to come from families in which very little respect is accorded to the parents. Apiri, if I had been your father, would you have tried to remind me about your image in my duty? Stand up when I'm speaking to you. That is the teacher. The words and hands, you get that? The words and the hands slashed out simultaneously. A period's ears buzzed, and he felt his head swell with shame. Now, get out of my class, Taki wrapped out, and headed for the entrance door. A period had got down slowly from the lab stool on which he had been sitting. Shifting slightly, putting a fast foot down, then the other on the floor. Then he had come out of, the, the, out of behind the long bench into the center aisle. As he shuffled towards the entrance door, his face was dark, convulsed with the, the kind of rag, ragging, furry he could not feel felt for a long time. But still, he wasn't thinking of hitting Taki. No, he had not thought of hitting Taki at all. Taki, on the other hand, thought that all those shifting muscles on Apure's face were only a reflection of the shame and embarrassment he must have been feeling about being slapped in the presence of his fellow students. When Apure reached Taki, all the control he had he had marshaled, simply snapped, his right hand jacked upwards and connected with the turkey scene. Taking turkey by storm, Apure went wild, his stout finger 
a wheel of motion, jumping, kicking, and even batting Taki's nose with his forehead. Twin streams of crimson blood gush out of the teacher's nostril. We are moving on to... Yes, so if we are to summarize what, what is Ochunyo telling us? What is Ochunyo trying to portray in the novel Fate of the Banish? Ochunyo is actually showing us the evil and the outcome, the impact of corporal punishment. Uh, as students are being punished, they are also becoming aggressive, ready to reverse, ready to attack. And as one of our, uh, our authors, um, the, the, the literature review uh, was found out that actually, the students appear learned that actually a way of sorting out issues is through aggression. It is fight back. He has been slapped by the teacher, so he should also slap. It's a way of sorting problems. Uh, that is what um, Ochino is trying to portray, that in the school, some of the reasons why children become so aggressive or they are rebellious is because of corporal punishment. We can look at uh, Apiri and Arab. Arab. A rabbi would not have left school if the teacher was sensitive enough, you know? If, a rabbi, if the teacher was sensitive enough not to punish a rabbi, he would not have run away from school. So one of the reasons that children run away from school is corporal punishment, as reflected by, uh, depicted by uh, Ochino, we see that a rabbi ran away from school and he did not return. The father tried to convince him, but he couldn't listen. The same to Apire. At the end of the school, after Apire hitting the teacher, and the teacher was uh, bleeding, uh, Apire um, was sent away from school, completely left the school, and became nothing. But his leaving the school is because of the teacher, uh, who is the, the offender. So let us look at, we go forehead, look at the, 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 the Invisible Weaver by Okuruti, Karoro Okuruti. We look at the two characters in this novel, Ngora and Kwanzi, are the victims of corporal punishment. Uh, this is the teacher. The teacher's name is not mentioned, he's a mathematics teacher. And from the background, we see the teacher teaching, and the teacher is so harsh. He wants the students to cram, and if you cannot say it properly, the next thing is corporal punishment. The mathematics teacher were particularly harsh, or was, it was because most students did not understand the subject. They would give them few hours in which to cram the multiplication tables, maybe an evening. The following day, they would be ordered to recite them. On one particular morning, the teacher was extraordinary harsh. Ngora, no, the teacher said, Ngora, come in front and recite multiplication table for the number six, shouted the mathematics teacher. Ngora, Kwanzi's best friend, got up trembling. She went to the front of the class and stood rooted to the spot, speechless. Well, what is, what is the matter with you? Start. Ngora seems to have lost her speech. She looked at the teacher like a frightened rabbit. The teacher's cane rang out. It is impact on the buttocks resounding in the classroom. Stupid girl, recite the table, he shouted. Ngora just looked at him, dumbfounded. He could not utter a word. The teacher enraged, cane her again. Kwanzi cried uncontrollably. You, the teacher called out to her, come here. You are weeping for nothing. Well, I'll give you something to weep about. Recite number six table. As she walked past him, he suddenly pulled her skirt. She stripped off and fell down. 
think that you are very clever. Do you? Show me what is in your sweet palms, he said with an evil girl, glint. Come on, open your palms, he said between clashed teeth. He hit her fist hard, and it was uncurled, and he saw the multiplication tables. The students, the students records, okay, sorry, what? There's, there's a heading. <laughs> Yeah, there is, there, there is a heading which is missing. Okay, uh, this is a theoretical framework. The students, re the students record, memorize, cram, chant, repeat these phrases without perceiving how, this, how they come to 16 as an answer. An answer of four times four. This is Ferrari. We are looking at in Invisible Weaver. We are looking at uh, Ngora and Nkwanzi, who are told to cram tables, uh, table six. And so, because they're just cramming, they are cramming, they don't even understand what it is, and because they, don't, they, they are not understanding, they are being pin punished or because of uh, multiplication table, which it, 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 it has no meaning to them. This is according to Ferrari. In the subhuman thinking, an inferior apiri cannot challenge a superior teacher who is a symbol representing the white race. Of course, uh, when we look at Apire, Apire challenged the teacher, and at the end, Apire uh, was given a serious corporal punishment and retaliates. But why was he punished? Because as a student, he was supposed to just sit and listen without questioning back, but he was um, punished for that. The, stu the study concludes that corporal punishment in schools has been portrayed as the root cause of school dropout as we look at uh, a rebel. A rebel left school because of corporal punishment. Uh, uh, Ngora left school and got married to a, 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 a very old man because of corporal punishment. Apire also dropped out of school and was put actually in prison for hitting the teacher. Moreover, he learned that, that uh, solving an issue should be done by violence. And he was just trying to do what the teacher was doing, but at the end was put in prison and he, he left the school. So we say that uh, it, reduces vi it, it produces violence, as we see from a period fighting with a teacher. Fear, as we could see that um, uh, when we look at... Uh, Gora, she stood speechless. She couldn't say anything. She was trembling. There was fear in her. Uh, timidated and, and social behavior that we see from the characters, Irabo, Apire, and aggressiveness. We look at Apire uh, was very aggressive, ready to fight the teacher. Fake submission, fake submissiveness. Uh, Ngora, to stand up and just come in front, you know, she was like submitting to the teacher, but that was fake submission. A rebellion of the students uh, we see from the characters, uh, mental health, depression. We look at these students after being sent away from school. When you follow up the lifestyle that Irabo led, actually it was a depression because at the end of, uh, of their leaving school, they joined rebels and they became real rebels. And at the end of his Apire even killed, um, he killed Father Dilo because of the violence that actually he learned from school. He killed Father Dilo. Apire uh, Irabo, after joining the war, he, he of course killed, and at the end of the day, he was also killed. And poor academic achievement, we look at all our characters. None of them uh, continue with the school, apart from in, in Kwanzi. Uh, it uh, creates okay, academic achievement and creates lower self-esteem. We look at the characters. Ngora couldn't speak. Irabo just say, uh, uh, I'm tired, I'm fed up of school and depressed, and criminal behavior among the youth. When we look at Irabo, and uh, who joined a rebel group, he became nuisance to the society. And we look at Apire, one of the biggest scenes he did is to kill the priest in cold blood. He shot the priest and died. And uh, we can look at that even up now in our youth, among the youth, the criminal comes as a result of uh, corporal punishment that they receive at school. 
the recommendations. The researcher recommends that the Ministry of Education and the district inspectors of school should endeavor to end corporal punishment because it diminishes a student's capacity to grow up as an autonomous and responsible person. If a period was responsible enough, he would not have killed the priest, uh, Father Dillon. This study suggests that the teachers should use alternative forms of correction of students' misbehavior. Those are the references. Um, can I request Mark to play for us something? Uh, the view about corporal punishment? Here we are going to view uh, how corporal, corporal punishment is done in Ugandan school, primary school in Uganda. The teachers are there, we shall look at the teacher, the way he punished the students, he got, she got a stick uh, right in the compound and the, 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 the young students, the young peoples were made to lie somewhere in the compound, somewhere in the veranda, we are going to see, please uh, enjoy. You can see the students, some already down. The teacher is uh, really punishing them. As they are being punished, they have no say. The small baby is also right there. You can see, do you see her, him carrying something? He's ready to punish. <laughs> There's another student there, a child is already lying, and there are sticks, there are sticks there. You can see the teacher coming for her, over him. There are more, they are lying, waiting to be punished. The teacher is getting more stick, the other one is finished. Is look, she's looking for another better one. So when you look at the students running, they are fearing already. It's not respect to the teacher, but fear. So the number has increased. We can see what is happening. The other one has put the hand, but he's being given canes. You can see the teacher, uh, one teacher is walking, but he's not also bothered. Yeah, so, um,
Thank okay. you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, for that wonderful presentation. I could hear from you speaking from different corners of our country where violence, fear, timidity, uh, and social behavior, aggressiveness, fake submissiveness, rebellion, mental ill health, depression, poor academic achievement, and low esteem, and much more is depicted. And as you rightly conclude and recommend that the Minister of Education needs to end corporal punishment. How? Actually, corporal punishment is outlawed by the Minister of Education. And we would like to see how you relate the novels to what is actually on the ground in practice. If the Minister of Education is to take your recommendation, you need to tell us how, from the way Karuru and um, Ochuino have depicted it. How can it be fought? How can it be uh, challenged? How do they suggest to us? Is there any suggestion that they make? Luckily enough, Mary Karuro Krut is a senior citizen and a minister in the government, so she knows what she wrote about and she knows what she sees every day. Have you interviewed her on this aspect so that we can get an insider's story of what is happening? Of course, the Gora and Nkwanzi are real issues. Mathematics. How are we going to go science and technology if mathematics is the source of all those evils? Just to mention the language used. Shouted, trembling, rooted, speechless, stupid girl, enraged, stripped, evil glint, clenched teeth, all these are very negative in the sense that when we read them, we certainly get a negative side of this, this math teacher and math lesson. And yet we are saying uh, we are going science and technology. So what is your comment about that language? And how does language apart from the physical corporal punishment, how does language itself become a source of evil, a source of corporal punishment? Which is worse, the physical pain or the pain derived from emotional stress in terms of the bad language that is used? you need to handle all those in the invisible weaver. Perhaps that is the invisible weaver. We need to find out. You need to tell us what is that in the sense of being an invisible weaver. Uh, yes, you talked about uh, Nochuño's um, fate of the banished, the failing in the PLOE uh, was worse than a disease. Again there, the language is tilted towards the negative, the bad, the unappealing. Uh, of course, you needed to make your quotations so that we are able to enjoy the interaction of the conversations between these people, the appearers and the whoever else was talking, so that we can mark out the, the characters and what they are saying and what they are doing and what is happening around them. You rightly point out that aggression is perpetuated and the children in Ochino's fate of the banished learn to fight back. They are dropping out of school 
And so there is rejection and dejection. The same question comes up. If the Minister of Education is to fight, as you say, corporal punishment, and these stories are showing us graphically how corporal punishment happens. In the YouTube recording, you showed us while the mother, the woman, the teacher, was caning the children, the young boy or girl it was, carried the leaf or whatever she was carrying and also wanted to go and cane. By seeing, they are learning. And so it overflows. The gentleman who was passing by just looked and continued walking on their way, which means that in this society, caning, beating, fighting, ridicule is acceptable. So when we read these things in these works, how are we able to change the status quo if this is what we have learned, not only in writing, but also in the practice? What is your comment about that? I, I could end there for now and uh, ask my colleagues also to ask some questions, but mine were thoughts, and to thank you very much for enlightening us on these matters. Thank you, Mary. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mary. You, uh, your presentation makes me want to read those books. Um, and I think it's um, important for all of us. Paul, Paul and I have been having this discussion about how fictional literature um, explores and informs our real lives. And for Paul's topic, it's about materialism in pieces of fiction during the Idi Amin um, uh, era. Uh, and so I think a lot of times that the real world forgets that the really uh, good pieces of literature we have can really make us think and make change. So anyway, I commend you for that. Uh, I was thinking that the, along the same line that the uh, psychological impact of those stories and the actions, as well as the physical, uh, because many times um, the psychological piece in all of our lives is what impacts us more than uh, something that hurts our body parts. So I thought about that. Um, I think um, just a few grammar punctuation kinds of things, APA style kind of checking with that to make sure um, and I, I do like the fact that uh, the literature department here does this pre-oral presentation because it's, it's very valuable. Um, when I wrote, uh, and I commend you for getting your PhD because I only have a master's degree, but when I wrote my dissertation, I did content analysis as well. And I'm kind of curious how you're doing that. Uh, when I wrote mine, we didn't have computers to do it for us. So I had to do it by hand with the different words. And also, I had to get an independent person to verify that the content analysis I did was uh, the same as what another person did. So I was curious about how you were doing that. Um, and I think uh, that's, that's pretty much what I have to say. So okay. anybody else? Question? Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mary. Um, I want to thank you for the presentation. Uh, it is giving us light and knowledge on how to go about being that uh, we are stepping your feet. I have uh, three, four areas that I wanted to more light. Uh, in your, I think it was uh, the purpose or problem statement, you say there is no, there has been no attempt in Uganda uh, about corporal punishments. I was wondering, was it in Uganda or in the particular texts? Because a lot has been written about corporal punishments, but is it in the two texts in particular that no one has come out 
to find out, to study or to analyze those depictions of corporal punishments. Then I want more light on the theoretical framework that is the post-colonial theory, how it relates to the topic of corporal punishments. And then uh, could there be some positive effects of corporal punishment besides the negative ones? I don't know. Then lastly, in your recommendations, you recommended the Minister of Education to work hand in hand with the schools. And you say they should use alternative ways. I don't know whether it is possible to suggest also the alternative ways that could be used to instill discipline and curb misbehavior in schools. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's hear from uh, Mary. She tells us. No, please. Go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you very much um, for your contribution. Patty, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Gulere. I'm very grateful. Uh, let me begin from the last. Um, what is corporal punishment? What I have presented is just um, an iceberg. The whole work has what definition, the definitions, and so on. So I have um, the write-up, but you know in the slides, you cannot put everything. You just pick some points. So if um, my supervisors have the whole work, so I just picked out um, what is necessary for the, for the presentation of the slides. So definition of corporal punishment is actually simple. Yeah, it's, it's a way that um, uh, an adult or any person can use, you can use a belt, you can use a stick, you can use, as we saw from the film, anything that you hit on the child, harassment on the child or on the students is actually, that's what we call corporal punishment. Some, some actually so severe that uh, this bleeding, as you saw from uh, uh, Uchunyo, yeah, the teacher was bleeding out of the, the reverse of the corporal punishment. So I, I will give you the whole work. Then uh, the effect, uh, what are the positives? We, we are looking at corporal punishment that it's not only the way of uh, correcting a child. 
If I tell you, for example, put your head down because you are disturbing the class, and I tell you, kindly put your head down. Can you put your head down? Try it. Without me harassing you with all these languages, stupid, uh, you know, there are words that actually can irritate. But if I tell you, please, kindly put your head down, and we go on, or I can tell you, can you stand up? You know, it is, it's, it is, it will look odd out of the blue that I'm not getting a stick, I'm not moving my belt or a stick or a table to hit you, but I just tell you stand up and you realize actually I've done something wrong. I like what happens in Gayaza. They have a tree called the evil tree. So if you are uh, doing something wrong in the classroom, they tell the students to go and stand and face that tree. And whoever passes will know that actually that one did something wrong in the classroom. I think that is the alternative that uh, the teachers can actually use to punish the students. Um, I, I want to answer Paul. Paul, you said uh, there's a lot of literature. Yes, that's why I have a lot of literature review. Uh, maybe before you go to Paul, to, to Paul I, I wanted us to look a little deeper into this matter of the alternatives mm. and uh, what we learn from Ochunyo and Okrut. Um, take, for instance, uh, the example you gave in the math class. What was the problem? Um, cram work. The problem is, is math. math, math. What, what was exactly happening at that point? Just go to that slide. Scroll down. Continue. Go to my, uh, uh, I want the exact words from Okrut. The mathematics teachers were, were particularly harsh, or was it because most students do not understand the subject? They would give them a few hours in which to cram the multiplication tables. Maybe an evening. The following day, they would be ordered to recite them, ordered. Uh, one, on one particular morning, the teacher was extraordinarily harsh. Okay, let's go to the next one. No, no, too fast. Slow. Uh -huh. Gora came in front, Gora, come in front and recite the multiplication table for the number six for the number six, shouted the mathematics teacher. I think this is where we are, we are being challenged by the writer to look at language. Did the math teacher have to shout? Because even by shouting, it is enough to intimidate this child who had the whole evening, perhaps with their mother and father and brothers and friends, going through the multiplication table. But when the teacher shouts, it's not because the child doesn't know the table that they fail, but perhaps because of the shouting. Yeah? Gora, Nkwanzi's best friend, got up trembling. And the trembling, in my view, could be as a result of the shouting from the teacher. Because yeah, because now that becomes psychological. The child feels that they do not know from the response that they have been given. She went to the front of the class and stood rooted to the spot, speechless. Well, what's the matter with you? I guess that is now a sentence. Eh? If somebody else, yeah, you have to do it like that. Eh? Start another shout. No, very short, stern word. Start. Start. <laughs> you know, you are talking to a human being. So in, sim in, in the same way, when you give us the example of Gayaza and the evil tree, evil tree, and everybody comes and sees this errant child looking at the evil tree, mm -hmm. eh? it's not different from carrying bones in your neck <laughs> because you have spoken your language. You get that? Mm -hmm. And 
the self-esteem of the child goes and they become rebellious because all these people looking at them being harassed and mistreated will make them want to show that they are greater than this person who is punishing them. So it's no longer about the lesson you are giving them, but it's about the negative uh, forces that you are creating within their human being. And therefore they will do anything. They live in strike. They live in a, they refuse to learn. So we need to take this very, very critical. As you are doing textual analysis, analyze each and every one to be able to come up with possible solutions and question, why is this child speechless? Why is this child rooted to the spot? I mean, Okrut tells us this because she wants us to see and feel like Gora. And by feeling like that, let's go to the next one. She looked at the teacher like a frightened rabbit. Eh? That simile is very, very, very strong. Like a frightened rabbit. How, is, how does a frightened rabbit look like? Eh? And of course, these little kids, they are either called the kids, the children of God, so they are called little rabbits. Eh? And then they are there, you know, all shivering. The teachers came, mm -hmm. ran out. Hmm? So they ran out, sorry. The teachers came, ran out. It did not even just bring it out, like to, to tease a little bit or to use it for, but right, the, the use of that word, it is not as much as the, mul the multiplication table that she was even requiring from this child. Eh? Look for the word association for that word, the cane rang out. Its impact on the buttocks resounding in the classroom, you can imagine, like this microphone being heard, whatever it's being heard. Eh? Accompanied not only by the resounding, but also with the words, stupid girl, recite the table. He shouted, he shouted. He didn't remark, he didn't talk, he didn't say, he shouted. That's where the problem is. So, to answer the question that you are going to answer, I would personally feel that when we look into those things that happen between the teacher and the learner, that is where we can find the alternatives. Does the teacher have to shout? Does the teacher have to do all the things that we are looking at there? How have others done it? Mm. I thought I should raise this before you, you, you give the answer there. I'm very grateful, Dr. Glere. Wow. I had not uh, recognized that um, similes <laughs> and so many things inside there. Yeah, the language, as you said earlier even uh, in your um, addition, the language is very, very important. Very, very important. Because when we look at this, the, the Ngora rooted, I mean, she can't move. She's fearing what is next, what is coming. And actually, at the end, we hear the teacher's cane rang out. And it is impact on the buttocks resounding in the classroom. So her rooting out and being speechless, she actually had already foresee what is coming, what is next. It was uh, an oversight. She was able to see that at the end of this harassment, at the end of this uh, stuff, the hard words, I'm going to get something. And so she was rooted, speechless, and waiting to uh, the teacher to uh, a poor <laughs> whatever was in, in his heart. So, uh, as Dr. Glory say that we, we, as we look at the words, as we look at the words and the, the real uh, corporal punishment, we are able to look at the students that actually, if a child is rooted in one place, what do we need to do? We need to become a friend of that child. If I fail to recite the table, uh, I think one way is to 
befriend the, 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 the class. I can give an example of my class this semester in May. I had a student who kept on moving out of my class to pick a phone call, and she didn't do any coursework. So what did I do? I called her, and we had time, not once, not twice. We talked, and she came down, and she was able to do all the coursework, and she was able to do the assignment without uh, calling her stupid guard, uh, her lot, whatever. Because the way she was dressing up, you could think she had just come to lot around, you see you, and go. But as we sat and talked, she changed her habit. So this teacher, um, the teachers today, we need to befriend the children, and they become our friends. And uh, I also want to think that one-to-one -one can also be another alternative of helping the students. If I'm not very active in class, if I fail, then I need one-to-one. -one. Maybe it can happen that uh, my learning, I'm a slow learner, but does not mean that I'm stupid, as the teacher is calling uh, Gora. I'm not stupid, but I'm just a slow learner. And at the end of the day, I can reach the genius in class. So what do I need? I only need to sit with this student and or a child and teach one-to-one. -one. I'll be able to discover the child's problem and be able to uh, help her or him come out of that uh, 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 situation. So one-to-one -one can work and follow up the, the student and also, not just to shout, this uh, kind of shouting. The moment you shout at somebody, even if a big person, they, you will switch off. You just switch off. But if you use friendly language, we need to use friendly language to speak to the students and make them understand that what they have done is wrong or make them know that we want something good from them. Because if we use uh, hard words, you know, yeah, this... Uh, words are so tough. So at the end, I know the student will run away from school, as we see from the characters. They all ran away from school. And we also think that actually, you know, this is the way to go. So at the end of maybe the teacher, this teacher who is harassing the students, he was also harassed one day. And he says, this is the way to go. I also harassed. The day I qualify to be a teacher, I will harass you properly. So the impact, you know, it is like... Uh, it's like a coil, it's rotating. Mm? You harass me as a student, if I persist and I finish my teacher training, I will harass my class because I want to pay back. Because we say that part of it is you become so aggressive. Using a soft word is, is not part of me because I didn't go through it. So what do we learn from this? Actually, yeah, thank you. The point that you've just made right now, I think the teacher, I, I, which the one who said, I need to go to school, university, and the college just to come and be insulted. Be insulted. I think uh, the, the writer, the, 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 the novelist, is bringing this out purposely mm. to hint mm. onto that formation. Yes. Yeah. Mm. What do we go through during our formative mm. stages? Yeah. Yeah. And how can we break? The, the, that, that when we are crossing over from the bad history to the kind of history that we need to create, how do you disengage yourself from a bad past to get into a better future? Mm. That is where the challenge is. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Um, the other thing, uh, as you said, uh, you know, when uh, Apire told the teacher that we are not interested you know, the teacher would have given the student a hearing. You know, why are you saying what you're saying? Maybe had a reason of saying that, hey, look here. We are interested in what you're teaching, but you're telling us other stories. So the teacher needed to give the child, the student, the hearing. You know, we need to listen, not just to talk, because sometimes that is where Ferrari uh, comes in, because uh, Ferrarian... Uh, theory of cultural invasion, uh, he inserts that um, this kind of teaching, it is to say that the students have nothing. They know nothing. And so for us to impart knowledge in them, it's like we are putting uh, knowledge into an empty tin. But these young oh, students, they are not empty. Their brain can function. 
that if you tell them, instead of just cram uh, number six table, instead of cramming, is there an alternative? There's a way that we can make the students learn that uh, multiplication table is not about cram work. You know, it's not about cram work. So the teacher also lacked a method of teaching. You don't just cram multiplication table. That is not the real thing. There's a method that the teacher should have learned that actually, how do we come to six times two? Not just cramming, and at the end of the day, the child has forgotten. Because uh, uh, the child crammed, and by the time they called her in front, calling her all the names, she has forgotten everything. So part of this is uh, teachers should also not use cram work as a method of teaching. The child should discover a way, method of discovering how do I come to two, uh, maybe two times two. The uh, methods of, uh, of multiplication table than just cramming. So I think I uh, can move on to alternative. Have I answered you? Yes, Paul. Um, yes. When you look at all my literature, literature review, it shows that a lot of research has been done. However, no study has been done in Ugandan novels. Ugandan novels. Uh, it has been done in science, in theology, in whatever schools. But my research is specifically on Ugandan novels. How are the authors portray corporal punishment? And no research has been done on uh, these two novels, uh, Ugandan novels. So the literature review is, is a lot. You, if you get the whole work, you'll find that actually it is, it's a lot, but not in the Ugandan novels. If you try to Google, you will not find it. Um, I think you had some question with her. What is the alternative? Um, what else did you talk about? Yes. So I, 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 um, as I was presenting, I was bringing it the theoretical framework. Because we talked about um, Apure being so aggressive. And um, Apire, Erabo, of course, Ngora. Ngora was not able to answer. So that brings it uh, uh, Gayatri Spivak in her book, uh, Can the Subhaltan Speak? Her answering back of Erabo and uh, Apire, Apire, actually, his answering back was punished because he tried to answer the representative of, of the superior. So, uh, of the uh, Apire is inferior race. And then we look at the teacher. He represents the superior race. So for him to answer that, to Spivak, that is not allowed. So he has to be punished. That is the theory I was using. And then when you look at um, the Gora and Kwanzi, that brings in Ferrarian theory of cultural invasion. That for them, you know, they needed to sit down and they be filled. I was talking about it already. You know, the, the teachers think that these students have empty teens, you know? So they need to be filled in. And that's why they are told, you know, cram, cram this table. Go and cram in the evening. Come and present in the morning because their brains are empty. Instead of sitting with the students and tell them, how do we come to the answer of six times two, you know? And maybe to allow the students play with these tables, discover how six times two comes to 16. They are not given that. They are just told cram, because you have empty team. So cram, six times two, 16. So they are just cramming. So that brings us to theory of cultural invasion of Ferrari. Well, you are at that same point. When can the subaltern answer back? I think somebody asked that question. Yes. Are these children or learners ever, do they ever have a right to answer back, according to your theory? Or they only answer back when they are becoming violent and murdering and... Um, Of course, when Spivak, uh, in her, her, her book, can subaltern, uh, can Sub Alton speak? 
You know, that is a question mark. And when we look at Apire, Apire tried to answer the teacher by saying that we are not interested. You know, he was trying to say that actually we can speak. So Subhaltan can speak, but the outcome might not be good. As we look at Apire, uh, he was punished, was sent out. First of all, he was thrown into the prison. He was in the police cell for five days. And then he was dismissed from school to go and find uh, and some, uh, his labor somewhere else. So they are trying. Yes, they can try to speak, but the outcome, they will not like it. As we see from Irabu yeah, and, then and their period. At another point, you say that um, the girl ends up <coughs> getting married. Yes. And I think in marriage, Reasonably, there is a lot of high life. People enjoy themselves. They are not harassed, they are not embarrassed, or at least that's what they assume. This is what they get into at the beginning of it. So how is it possible that in a society where the voices of the children are gagged, they cannot speak back, how is it possible to stop um, early marriages? You've heard of the sexuality uh, framework, which is being uh, floated around and also in the rest of the world. How is it possible for these children to be told that actually this very nice and interesting institution of marriage can wait, yet actually what they are experiencing in school and in the home is terrible? Why shouldn't they go and find their own families? What do you have to say about that? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, actually, when you look at the story, Ngora, this mathematics teacher, doctor, the mathematics teacher, later on raped her, raped Ngora, because Ngora drew up, drew closer to the teacher to learn more because she was a weak student. And at the end of the day, the teacher abused Ngora. She became pregnant, and the teacher told her, never dare mention that it is me that has pregnanted you. So Ngora was sent out of school because of the teacher. The teacher actually was not punished, and she went home pregnant. And what happened? Because she became, um, she became um, what is the right word? She's a mischief. She's shameful. She brought actually shame to the family. So what happened? The father married Gora to a very old man, extremely old man and poor, because she, the, the parents were already ashamed. Taking Gora to school, it was not cultural, accepted. But she ended up going to school, which was not accepted by the society. And so to the father, was, you know, the easiest thing was to give her to anyone who is ready to take her up because she's second hand. Remember that in African tradition, according to here, virginity is very, very important. And a girl that has already been uh, raped, she's already pregnant, she's no longer virgin. So she's, she's a taboo to the family. So the father gave her out to a very old man and um, we could see Ngora walking with a man she has never seen, going to her home, the new home she has never even known. And the moment they reached, you know, they were um, um, uh, Okurut portrays the house. It was a very small grass-touched house, leaking. And as Ngora enters, this man is having already some other women. And so what happened? She reaches, and the old lady, the old wife to the man, gives them, he calls the bed sheet barely thread. It is very old with holes all over. And so gives her that bed sheet, and then the mat, that's where she is supposed to, to live in. So she's actually a taboo. It's the abomination to be pregnant. But she cannot talk. Remember, she was not talking in class. She's not talking to tell the father, no, I cannot go with this old man. Uh, old man. The situation is what's from the school to home, and we see her going with this man, and that very man also raped her, you know, and the following morning, she's given a hole to go and dig, and slapped, and so on. So, 
doctor is asking about um, the early marriage. We, we go back to school that as teachers, we should be able to understand that's what maybe uh, Okorut is trying to say, that the moment a girl child is given opportunity to come to school, we should actually be um, the promoters. We should promote the education of the child, of the girl child, knowing that the culture is, is not supportive. So if the teachers were supportive to Ngora, this early child marriage, or him, uh, Ngora being given to an old man, a man who had already many wives and many children, it would not have happened. But because of the school that had no support to the student, what happened to Ngora? She ended up going to a worse uh, family or husband than the, her being at school. So teachers should support girl child education. In the United States, um, we coddle our children too much, I think, that we've gone overboard. Um, but I am seeing in Uganda that there needs to be some change. Um, there's a, a famous quote for teachers, I don't care what you know until I know that you care. I don't care what you know until I know that you care. And I think that philosophy impacts all of us. Uh, whether you know, it's someone we work with or our family members, um, because that's just such a critical part of teaching and learning. Um, I'd like to recommend to you that you maybe do just a little bit of research on public shaming. I read a really good book last year and um, remind me, and I think I have a summary of it that I wrote for a journalism class here that I can send to you on public shaming uh, because um, the psychological piece of what we do to children is just, uh, it's horrendous sometimes, and what we do to each other. So, so anyway, I just want to thank you for, uh, and I'm anxious to see where this goes beyond your degree, if there is some kind of impact, if you end up presenting at a conference, uh, to bring attention to literature and show how literature can connect to these real life parts of us is, is really important and I, I, I thank you for that, so. Thank you, thank you very much. Anybody with uh, an additional comment? Just a comment? Uh, thank you very much, it's not a comment. I just want to learn one thing about uh, citations or quotations in text. For example, I can see Okrot, and uh, after the year, it's uh, a colon. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I just want to get from the seniors. That is APA. Yeah. We are supposed to use colon is not a comma after the year. It depends, but this is APA. We, there's MLA, yes. Harvard uh, University, uh, Harvard Citation, MA, MLA, and APA. This is um, APA. This is the one we use here, APA. Okay. Yes, uh, but in UCU, different faculties use different things. Although the, the School of Postgraduate and Research are writing out one major research manual for the university to be used. I think it is out, but this is APA. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Our colleagues there? Thank you so much, Mary, for the presentation. Uh, personally, you've uh, reminded me what used to happen in our schools. Uh, personally, I was caned seriously in primary four because of mathematics, and I hated that teacher uh, for quite a very long period. It's only my mom who used to tell me, Stephanas, please forgive the teacher, and I would say, no, I will not. I remember forgiving that teacher after my senior six. Yeah, it took a long time for me to, to, to forgive her because Syria said they used to cane us too much. Mm -hmm. And personally, it was mathematics. And they, it was so interesting what you were presenting. It was rotating on that same subject, part of it. 
And that's the subject where I had a challenge. And actually, I think it's the one which caused me to hate the subject. Yeah, I hated it up to, a, up to finishing A level. I, whenever I could say anything mathematical, I could say, ah, I'm not interested. But thank you so much for the presentation. And I hope you take serious the comments which Professor, uh, Dr. Aguilera has highlighted. And in the future, I hope to get the best results. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, yes. Actually, mine is not very different from me, is eh? But thank you for the presentation. Uh, me too. Actually, you touched a very a nice subject, mathematics. It was a problem. Me, myself, I dropped math and PE in P primary five because of the way they were treating us. Mm. Seriously, it was very, very bad in that you would not even get... Actually, you look at the timetable, you find that you have math on that very day, you hate the whole day. You hate the whole day because you know... It's all about calculations. Every number you fail, you call up, you cane, go back and sit, they give you another one, you fail. They cane you like the whole day. Mm. Yeah. But thank you so much for the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for making time to come and listen to this very important topic of the depiction of corporal punishment in the works of Mary Karuro Krutu and Julius Ochuino, The Invisible Weaver and Fate of the Banished. As Ugandans, we should be proud that we have authors like these who have spoken to our lives and have actually lived through these very lives themselves, so they are not creating anything. It is a fiction, but also based on fact, as our two colleagues have testified. Your duty as a scholar is to make sure that you bridge the gap between the reality and the expectations of society. Uh, because uh, as we always say, uh, the poet is the unacknowledged legislator of society. So what are we legislating by saying these things the way we say them? This is how corporal punishment gets entrenched. And so these two novelists have very tactfully used the language to dissuade us from what is negative. And it is important that we look in those other corners where they are persuading us to go in order to make the best recommendations for action. Thank you all, and may God bless you closing prayer. Um, let's humble ourselves and we pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for everything that has transpired here. But most importantly, we thank you because you enabled each and every one of us to make it here. We know it was your grace. Lord, at this juncture, now that we are coming to a close, we ask that wherever we may be going, Lord, be with us. Open our minds that whatever we may do today may be for the good of your glory. Lord, we particularly thank you for Mary. We ask, Lord, that you give her wisdom, give her courage. Working on research is not an easy thing, but the fact that she has this together means that she's destined for great things. God, give her wisdom, give her knowledge. Let her be open-minded so that whatever she comes up with at the end is for the benefit of all. Again, Lord, we thank you, and we ask you to be with each and every one of us as we go out. Bless us today, and may your kingdom come in all our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Dr.